Thank you, Vance. That was great. Fabulous, fabulous. Okay, the only two announcements that I want to remind you about, first of all, the pre-trib conference coming up December 7th through 9th, and uh, we will be holding it. That will be in person, uh, and uh, as far as I know, just because of certain other uh, realities. So that is uh, open to anyone who wishes to attend, and it's going to be a great conference this year, and a good chunk of it is going to deal with the history of dispensationalism, um, as well as uh, some other important topics. So that will be on uh, December 7th through 9th. The other thing is that um, uh, we're going to be having our men's prayer breakfast this month, for sure, along with our deacons meeting, and that is on October the 24th. 24th. That's what I was going to say. I was just doing the math in my head. Thank you. But I can always use the help with numbers. You know that. Okay. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we know that we need to be in right relationship with the Lord. This is essential to our spiritual life, our spiritual growth, our maturation. And as we ended last time talking about Ephesians 5.18 along with Colossians 3. Uh, 16 and following, that one of the important aspects or results of walking by the Spirit is mentioned first in a list of several things in both passages as singing. Singing and uh, exhorting, teaching others with what we sing. So the emphasis there is on content. And so this is a characteristic of walking by the Spirit. It shows us it's not optional, uh, singing. But, and, uh, just as walking by the Spirit is not optional. That is what we are to do, or there is uh, no growth. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to uh, confess sin if necessary, to admit or acknowledge your sin to the Lord, and instantly we're forgiven, cleansed, we go forward in our spiritual life, and so we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we come together this evening just so thankful that we have a relationship with you so thankful that we can study your word, so thankful that you've given us another day to live, another day to serve you, another day to manifest your character, your grace through our lives towards those around us and be a testimony uh, to the angels and to all those around us. Father, help us to keep our heavenly priorities and not be uh, so led by the Holy Spirit, I mean by the sin nature rather, not be led around by our sin nature, following our emotions and everything. Father, we pray for our nation. We are in a desperate situation. Few of us know how horrible things really are. We get glimpses of it here and there, but there is some, some real evil and wickedness that is taking place in this country. There are things going on that would make us sick if we knew about them. And Father, we pray that we might continue as a nation because on the other hand, there are those who love you. There are lo those who love your word. There are those who are uh, deeply committed to evangelism and to uh, witnessing here and abroad through various missionaries and supporting them. Father, we know that your word does not go forth on the basis of the United States of America, but Father, we we have many here who are so faithful in your, to your word and to you, and we pray that you would just change things. And that uh, one way that we need change is just somebody in, in politics who will say stop and may not get it all right, but we need leaders who will lead. 
And Father, we do pray that you would raise up men and women who have a biblical frame of reference, who can reorient this nation. It may not be easy. It may take a couple of decades or more. But Father, we pray that you would change things. Father, we pray for us tonight as we study your word that we might be strengthened and encouraged just as we study your word by all that it teaches us and all that we learn and that we might apply some of the things that we learn tonight just to expand our understanding of what it means to worship you, to glorify you, and to sing praises to your name. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are in Psalm 30. We are in Psalm 30, which is a praise psalm which David wrote following the judgment, the divine discipline God brought on Israel and on David, as we'll see in the next few verses, but that won't probably be until next week, that we have this this sin of arrogance, sin of self-sufficiency, sin of we don't really need God anymore, we have overcome and we have won the battles and we don't need to do it. God, do God's work God's way anymore. We did it all. And God uh, executed his judgment, his divine discipline on Israel as we studied in the last chapter of 2 Samuel. And there we saw that, that God brought this plague, intense plague on the nation for three days. And on the third day, David went to the uh, threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, And there he built an altar and he offered a sacrifice to God, calling upon God to forgive the nation for their sins. So it's the second time we see David as the king functioning in a priestly role. And he he does this and God, it says that, that the angel of the Lord stopped. He didn't go as far as he would have gone in taking the lives of these arrogant Israelites. And so David then writes this psalm as a psalm of praise. And in this psalm, it is clear that he is praising God because God has allowed him to live. So it's a very dangerous situation that he has been in. And we have studied in the previous verses that he uses a very uh, metaphorical language. God brought his soul up from the grave Uh, kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit, and that this is a very real threat. His life was in danger. I'm going to tie this to a couple of other psalms as we go forward in this sort of concluding series. Now, this is going to be part of a psalm series. We're just trying to figure out how to organize that and list it that way on the in the internet on the Dean Bible Ministries website. But for now, we're just including it as sort of the uh, addendum to uh, the study of 2 Samuel. So last time we came to Psalm 34, which encourages us, challenges us, exhorts us to sing praise to Yahweh. Because it's in the imperative mood, this is not an option. It is not optional. Some people think singing is optional. Well, I don't have a voice. Well, I don't see that that's a qualification here. There are no adjectives or adverbs. It's just sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Now, we'll get into some of the exegesis of the language here, you holy ones, and gift, and that refers to those who are believers who are walking with the Lord and give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name. And so tonight we're going to look at God, beauty, and music, a topic, subject that I introduced last time to focus on what does the Bible teach us about singing praise to God. Because there are su- there's such confusion out there about this today. And there are such battles, we call it the worship battles, because on the one side you have those who have very wrongly and unbiblically defined worship as singing, restricted it to that. That's not biblical at all. Worship means a whole lot more than simply singing. But here we have Psalm 30, verse 4, and last time at the end I took you to two New Testament passages that also talk about singing. And in Ephesians 5.18, we saw that the negative command was, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. Wine was the means of spirituality, okay, in 
in the worship of Dionysius, the goddess of wine, also in Latin, Bacchus, god of wine. So how would you get close to the god of wine? Well, you imbibe as much wine as you can. And that was the idea. If you got drunk enough, then his spirit would enter into your spirit, and you would speak in the god's language, which is like speaking in tongues. Now, that word glossolalia was never used of their ecstatic speech, but the Corinthians specifically got confused over that, and they thought that by speaking in tongues, that was a sign of spirituality, because that's what it was in the pagan, one of the pagan religions that was common in Corinth. It's also common. It wasn't the primary um, pagan religion in Ephesus, but it was part of the mystery religions that uh, were also very prominent in Ephesus, uh, the worship of Dionysius. And so it's interesting to look at this. You have a lot of people who think that the comparison is control, but it's not control at all. You have to look at the, the language, the grammar. It's the means to spirituality, and Dionysian worship was, um, was wine. The means to get close to God, biblically, is to walk by means of the Spirit and to let the Holy Spirit fill us with the Word of God. And it's important to compare this with Colossians 3.16, which I did last time. But my main point was that you have the command to be filled by means of the Spirit. And then it's followed by a series of participles. And these are result participles. So be filled with the Holy Spirit with the result that you will speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Three different uh, genre uh, of songs that were sung in the early church. And of course, psalms would relate to singing the psalms that were sung in the temple, the psalms in our, our, psalm, in our book of psalms. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord with the result that you give thanks always for all things to God the Father. So the first result of, of being filled by means of the Spirit is what? Singing. Singing to the Lord. The second result is giving thanks to the Lord. It's gratitude, grace orientation, thanking God that for each day that we're alive, that we can serve him, that God's given us another opportunity to learn his word. Now, it's very similar in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. That's the command. The result is teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's still listed first. Uh, last time I had pulled this over from a PowerPoint, and so the things got out of order, but you just take that comma out. It's not needed because it, when you translate it correctly, let the word of Christ dwell in you with all wisdom. Wisdom is skillful application of God's word. That's the idea in biblical wisdom. It's not intellectualism. It's not philosophizing. It's not a Greek concept at all. It's a very practical one of skillfully applying God's word. And that results in teaching, which means instruction. When we listen to people in the congregation and we're singing great, solid hymns that have good doctrine, good theology, then we learn from it. It has often been observed that people learn more of their theology from what they sing than what they hear in the sermon. And this was observed even in the early church that one of the great heresies in the early church was the heresy of Arianism. It's named after its founder, a deacon from Alexandria in northern Egypt, right on the Mediterranean, uh, went there last year. And... Um, Arius taught that there was a time when Christ was not. That Christ, that first there's the Father, and then sometime in eternity past, the Father created the Son. And then sometime later, the Son creates the heavens and the earth. But see, there's a time in eternity past even when the Father is all alone, and then he creates the Son. So that was his little, that was his little praise chorus. There was a time when Christ was not, and they sang it all over the empire. It's a real catchy tune. And so people learned heresy. And that's been true throughout the history of the church, that, that uh, a popular tune 
with heretical lyrics catches on and people sing it. And that's why we change lyrics here or there in our hymnal, just pick a better word, and it makes a, a, it's more correct, it's more biblically accurate. So we learn things and we're taught things as we sing and admonishes one another. You read, and this is one thing that's come out over the last six months. I've always told various hymn stories, but it's important to know some of the stories behind some of the hymns because they, they teach us that these hymn writers went through difficult times just as we do. It is well with my soul. We know that story about the Spaffords losing their daughters uh, the daughters on the ship with their mother going from New York to England hit a massive storm. The mother sent home a telegram when she arrived in England, saved alone. And so um, Mr. Spafford leaves Chicago, gets to the East Coast as quick, quick as he can, catches the next boat to England. When he gets near the spot, where his daughters died, he's notified by the captain, and he writes this incredible hymn. Well, the hymn can fit many different circumstances, just like Psalm 30, can, I pointed that out, can fit many different circumstances. And so we relate to it, that when we go through di difficult times, when we go through dark times, when we may be, there are hymn writers who we know from their life stories that they struggled with depression, there are theologians that struggle with depression. I read about one theologian, now remember this is back in the early 1800s in England, almost everybody smoked, and he spent years, in, never got out of bed hardly, chain smoking and writing theology, depressed, struggled with it. But sometimes that's part of what we do. Other people have other trends in their sin nature, and they struggle with worry, or they struggle with anger, or they struggle with uh, lust, money lust, sexual lust, uh, various other kinds of lust. We all have our areas of weakness in our sin nature. They never disappear. They never evaporate. They're never eradicated. And God, in his grace, still uses us. We confess our sins, and we're forgiven, and we just keep right on uh, growing and maturing, and God the Holy Spirit works in us, uh, in us to change us. And that's the process of the spiritual, spiritual life. But these hymn writers, uh, you would think of Fanny Crosby being blind from birth, and, and others, and just think about what that might be like. Mid-19th century, with all of the comforts of, that we have today, Right? You know, just think of the things that we use every day. We have indoor running water. We have indoor plumbing. We have indoor restrooms. We don't have to go out in the middle of the cold. Think about it. You're blind. You have to go to the bathroom at 2 in the morning. And you have to go outside, and it's 20 degrees or 10 degrees. And you have to kind of feel your way to get to the outhouse. They struggled with things, and they worshiped God, glorified God, and wrote hymns to the glory of God. It wasn't, always, it wasn't easy. I'm not going to say it wasn't always easy. It was maybe never easy, but they trusted the Lord. So as we walk, we, we sing, and we praise God, and we thank Him, and it keeps us focused on the ultimate realities. So we, uh, the Word of Christ is what the Holy Spirit fills us with. And it dwells or abides in us richly. That, that has the idea that it's not just something we get up in the morning and we read our two or three chapters of the Bible and then we fold it up and we kind of get real so busy we don't think about it anymore. It, it's something we, we're going to go back to over and again during that day when we get a chance so that we can really get it into our soul and it characterizes us. And I pointed out, I love this observation by David Wells. He wrote a series of four books in the 90s. Last one, I think, came out about 15 years ago. And they're, they're, they are in the tradition of, of Francis Schaeffer, in that, but much deeper, in that they are, he is analyzing and critiquing where the postmodern culture will take the postmodern church. 
and you go back and read him and you're like, how did this guy know in 1995 we would be where we are today? The same way Francis Schaeffer knew in, in 1968 because the big shift occurred in 64. And anybody who knew the word and knew history knew where we were going. Pastor Theme nails it. You go back, you listen to some of his stuff in the, in the 70s, and it, it, it's as applicable today as it was then because we had already made this shift from modernism and objectivity to postmodernism and subjective relativism. And anybody who was insightful knew exactly where that was going to go. It just took longer than some of them thought. So, David Wells, I quoted him last time, dealing with an uh, analysis of choruses. This was 15, 20 years ago, comparing, comparing praise choruses at that time with hymns. Almost 65% of all choruses had no doctrinal development or, of, or content. I think it's probably closer to 85%. I remember what was known as praise choruses in the 80s. I would sing them today. They're much more biblical. If I had my choice between singing what we went for praise choruses in the 80s and praise choruses today, I would choose the 80s because they had more content. They're not as good as hymns, but they had more biblical content. Many of them were Bible verses. I didn't care for the music so much, but they were better. It's just gotten worse because the church drinks at the faucet of postmodern culture. And it always has drunk from the faucet of the contemporary culture, whatever century you're talking about. And so he observes that it's almost impossible to find a hymn with no doctrinal development or content. But choruses have very little, if any. So what are some fallacies that we see related to understanding music and what is called the worship wars? First of all, people will say it's, it's about the beat. It all came in when we started listening to syncopated music. No, that's not right. That's, you, got, you, you don't understand it. It's not about syncopation. It's not about how fast you sing the music. Some music is designed to, be, to sing fast. It's got a good tempo, it's a beat, and it fits the words, it fits the lyrics. It's not about how fast, and it's not about when it was written. One of the things you hear is it's traditional versus contemporary. That is false. That is a lie. That is, uh, that is a fake analysis. There's a lot of old stuff that's garbage and heresy, and there's a few things written in the last 50 or 60 years that will last through the generations. But, but one of the things that you ought to notice is if it is classic, it's just like clothes. If, if something is classic, you, you, you can buy it and wear it for 10, 20 years. Nobody really knows the difference because it's classic. It's not trendy. But when it's trendy, it's not going to be even remembered in 10 years. And if I ask people about what went by as, as praise choruses in the, in the 80s, they never heard of them. But they know all the latest ones of the last five or six years. And so it just shows that the church is caught up with the trendiness of the world and not with that which has lasting power. And when we sing hymns, some of the, real, some of the best hymns, some of the great hymns have been around and sung by Christians for four, five, six hundred years in the body of Christ. Now that's staying power. They're not singing them because they're old. Because they were still writing new, new hymns along the way, but they followed a particular pattern musically and in terms of the lyrics and in terms of the content. So it's not about new versus old. It's about what is best and what isn't, what teaches solid doctrine, what doesn't. It's about quality, and it's not about how new it is. So it's not about when it was written, and it's not really about the theological associations of the writer. Because some of the writers of a good hymn didn't always have the best theology in some areas. H.G. Spafford, I just spoke about him and his wife Anna, who wrote it, and he wrote It Is Well With My Soul. After that, the death of their daughters, I think they had a couple of more daughters, 
they went back to Chicago. They just weren't happy. They had friends around them who had lost a lot of money in um, uh, a, a depression that occurred in the U.S. Uh, during that time. And they took a bunch of people who were just not real happy anymore. They had, for various reasons, wanted to leave the country. They went to Israel, and they, it wasn't really a cult, but it was just a band of people. They had it, and they established what became known as the American Hotel. It's still there. It's a great place to go visit. It has lots of history, lots of pictures. And they were there, but they expected Jesus to come. They kind of got off the track in terms of some eschatology and different things like that. Uh, you have a few other hymns that we sing. Uh, that are not written by those who are just right on the money theologically, but what's in the hymn is solid. So it's not really about the theological associations of the writer, and it's not about how it makes me feel. A good, a, a biblical message may not, I remember somebody when I was an early pastor said, oh, pastor, we need to come to church. I remember I was 29 years old. We need to come to church and, and leave feeling good. And I said, I don't find that in my Bible. What's it about? It is about the worldview of the music. In fact, um, Mark Friedrich told me that uh, he or Charlie Clough recently say something that was really insightful, and I think a good strategy. If somebody asks you how you're going to vote in the election, Charlie said, just say, I'm going to vote according to my worldview. And then some, if they're interested, they'll ask, and then you can kind of walk them through it. So it's about the worldview of the music. Does the music, not the words, but the music, music always reflects a worldview. Plato observed this, 5th century B.C. When a culture changes, the music changes. When a people change the way they think, their music will change. And that's what we've seen this. Think about how many times we've had musical shifts in the 20th century. That is a lot of cultural change. That's a lot of worldview change. We really shifted to uh, postmodernism around the turn of the 20th century, and it just took through the century for it to really work its way down from the intellectual, academic, uh, philosophical elites uh, down into the pew and into the street and into the gutter. And as it went from decade to decade, the music changed as the culture got more and more postmodern. It's uh, not about the, con I mean, it is about the content of the lyrics. What do the words say? Are they accurate? Are they biblical? Are they sound? Do they tell the truth? See, if you're not concerned with the truth, you can't be concerned about good music. Think about that. You're not concerned with truth. Because truth, to be concerned about truth presupposes you're concerned about objectivity. You believe in objectivity. But if you don't believe in objective truth, then you're not concerned about truth. You, the only thing you have left is, how does it make me feel? It's about the beauty and the aesthetics of the song. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. It's about the beauty and the aesthetics of the song, of the music and the words brought together. Tenth, it is about the correct form for expressing the content. The music, as I said last time, is like a frame to a picture. When you look at a picture, you shouldn't be seeing the frame. The frame is designed to enhance and to help you focus on the beauty of the artwork, of the visual artwork. If you look at a photo, you look at a portrait, you look at uh, any artistic representation of a painting, and you see the, uh, you go, wow, look at that frame. Isn't that wonderful? And you just don't pay attention to the artwork. You've missed it. it, it you shouldn't let the music of a hymn or a chorus or whatever override the content. It's about how the words are making you think. And then last, it is about glorifying God through utilizing our very best creativity to produce art that reflects the glory of our Creator. Okay, that's just good summary of everything. Now, I want to read you something. As an introduction tonight, this is an introduction in an article 
written by Dwayne Lindsay. Dwayne Lindsay was a professor. I didn't know him. Never had him for a class. I knew who he was. He was on the faculty at Dallas Theological Seminary in the 70s. And I really don't even know what whatever happened to him. He wasn't, I was probably in his 40s or 50s when I was a student at Dallas. He wrote a three-part series of articles on the Bible and aesthetics that came out in Bib Sac, Bibliotheca Sacra, the Dallas Theological Seminary Theological Journal uh, that uh, I've been... Uh, taking or a subscriber to since I was in college. And this article came out actually the spring of my senior year in, uh, in college. And I read it then, and I've read it about his all three, about three or four times over the years. And every time I go back and read it, I went, hmm, I don't remember this. It's not because I don't remember it. It's that every time I go back, 10 years has gone by, and I've learned a lot, and I get so much more out of it. I've learned so much more that it means so much more to me. But I, um, I looked at it today, and I, I thought his introduction was worth reading. So I want you to listen carefully. I hate reading something very long. It's a little longer than something I would like to read, but he makes the point in a way that I could never make the point, so I want to read this to you. A Rembrandt, Oro Rodin, who creates a work of art, deserves from the person who gazes upon it the response, that is beautiful. The eternal God who is infinite in all his perfections deserves from the believer who contemplates him the response, God is beautiful. God is beautiful, the pious Protestant might ask, searching his theological tradition for such an unheard of idea and reacting to the con connotation of pleasure, desire, and enjoyment that such an expression may connote. Yes, God is beautiful. The affirmation must be maintained. Now wait just a minute, the objector might say. Is not God invisible? How then can he be beautiful? Well, have you never heard of a beautiful symphony? Then beauty does not have to be physically visible, does it? All right then, but is beauty not limited to that which can be perceived by some sense experience? You see it? You hear it? Well, let's look at this from another direction. Miguel Nydorf, the Polish chess grandmaster now residing in Argentina, received a brilliancy prize for a chess victory, which has come to be known as the Polish Immortal. A relatively short 22-move game containing diverse actual and concealed combinations of play with seven sacrifices by Nydorf leading through a series of forced moves on his opponent's part and culminating in a crushing checkmate. This particular chess game is beautiful. Beautiful not because of the shape or the color of the pieces used, nor because of the visible movement of pieces on the board, but beautiful because of the logical coherence and variety of the combination of force time, and space within the principles of the game of chess. But the objector, still unconvinced, continues, does not God transcend space and time? How then can we speak of him as beautiful? The answer to this question must come out of the answer to another question. What is it that makes a picture beautiful? What is it that makes a symphony or a chess combination beautiful? What, in short, is the essence of beauty? Now, that's a lot to think about. But when we're thinking about singing to the Lord, what we sing in terms of the words and how we sing it, should it's not going to be the perfection of beauty, but it should endeavor to reach a standard of beauty. 
The problem is there are three different views of what makes something beautiful. The first we'll call the objective or the formal theory of beauty. In this view, beauty is an objective reality that's inherent in something. For example, when we say God is beautiful, then that means that within the inherent makeup of God as the creator God, the one who, within whom are all of the perfections in an infinite way, that he is beautiful and he then becomes the standard of beauty. Not just physical beauty, not musical beauty, but of all beauty. The second view is the subjective or emotional, or also called the psychological theory. And we know it because we hear this phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now, the interesting thing is that that statement was attributed to an English author who published a work, name escapes me now, but in 1878, and she said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's important to note that that idea is best expressed in that aphorism in the late 1800s. Now, there's a statement by Benjamin Franklin in his poor, uh, what's his name, poor whatever, almanac. What's his name, poor Richard's almanac. There's a statement by him that says something the same, that, that uh, beauty is, 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 really, uh, is really that which is perceived by somebody. And Shakespeare's got a couple of sayings like that. And there is some sense in which that is true. We all have different tastes. You know, some men will look at the same woman and one will think that she's beautiful or attractive and the other one will not. So there's a certain subjectivity there. But there is also the sense of an external absolute. And that's the third view, the relational theory, that there is such a thing as objective beauty. And it brings forth a subjective response. There is something as an objective beauty that something is beautiful. And if we believe in a creator God who created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them, then we must believe that he is the archetype of all beauty within his soul and that what he created was beautiful. And I'll come back to this later, but it is present within that word that God uses at the end of each day when he says that it was morning, that God looked at what he created that day and he said, it is good. And at the end, he said it was very good. That that word has several, several aspects to its meaning, but one of which is it conforms to a standard. And that standard is, at the very least, beautiful. It conforms to what is that standard, that there is some standard. So it's not just something that's totally, totally subjective. In the history of human thought, in Western civilization, ancient Greek philosophers, when looking at beauty, and thinking about beauty, and I've taught you this many times, that in in philosophy, it's grounded in what is called metaphysics or ultimate reality. doesn't matter what, where you stand or what your view of ultimate reality is, everybody starts there. It's either a god or many gods, or it's an impersonal force, or it's a personal infinite god. In Christianity, it is a personal infinite god who is omniscient, knows everything, and omnipotent and can accomplish anything he desires to accomplish and he is omnipresent, he is present to all of his creation, and he created everything. On the fact that there is a God who, who supervises his creation, we know that we can know things, and that there is absolute truth, even if we struggle to understand what that absolute truth might be at times. That is epistemology. How do we know what we know? Knowledge, not just information. Always remember this. We live in the information age. You can go to your laptop, you can get on the internet, and you can find all kinds of information about things that, that, 
that will make you a whiz at winning any kind of trivia game. You know, you'll learn things like black rhinoceroses run on their toes. Bet you never knew that. With that and $4.50, you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Maybe win Trivial Pursuit sometime. Who knows? There's all kinds of information you can get, but information isn't knowledge. Knowledge comes from putting together information so that you can come to understand more than the surface and the superficial. And it takes time for information to equate to knowledge, to real depth of understanding of things. But then knowledge isn't wisdom. Wisdom is knowing how to apply your knowledge in a skillful way. Knowledge is being aware that a tomato is a fruit, and so is an avocado. Wisdom is not putting them in a fruit salad. Real skillful wisdom puts them together with a little bit of a jalapeno pepper and you get guacamole. Information isn't knowledge and knowledge isn't wisdom. And that's why computers and technology and all of that will only get you so far, but it's the word of God that gets you wisdom and real knowledge. So ancient Greek philosophy broke down beauty as they're thinking through metaphysics and then epistemology, then they came to ethics. Well, how do you know what's right or wrong? And what they came to understand is that aesthetics, beauty, aesthetics is integrally connected to ethics. Let me put it another way. If you, if you don't believe that there's objective beauty, then you don't, probably don't believe in an absolute right or wrong. And if you don't believe in absolute right or wrong, you probably have a very subjective view of what beauty is. When this phrase that um, this British author used for beauty, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, when she writes that, and it really catches on, by the late 19th century, she could not, it would not have caught on the way it did if the culture had not changed to being a subjective culture in the way they viewed knowledge. At about the time the American patriots were fighting for their independence from Britain, there was a German scholar by the name of Immanuel Kant who put forth the theory of knowledge that we don't have objective knowledge. We don't know things as they are. We only know things as we perceive them. In other words, you can't have knowledge about the inherent makeup of something. You can only see your, you only know your perception of that. Up until that time in the history of philosophy, there was objective truth. You may not know it, but you, everyone believed there was objective reality and objective truth, and man could know it. And so objective truth means it's out there. And I have to investigate it, and I have to study it, and I have to learn all about it to know it. But his way of thinking was called the Copernican Revolution. What happened in the Copernican Revolution? Remember, Copernicus was a Polish astronomers, astronomer. And Copernicus was, lived at a time after Ga Galileo faced the same thing. But he lived not long after Gal Galileo, a couple, hundred, a couple centuries later, and he said, the, the solar system doesn't revolve around the earth. It revolves around the sun. And by this time, everybody said, yeah, you, you made your case. The sun is the center of the solar system, not the earth. So the center shifted from the earth to the sun. What happens in the way people thought after Kant was that the center shifted from outside objective truth to inside. All I can know is what I perceive. You look at it one way, somebody else looks at it another way, everybody has their own truth. 
Everybody has their own perception. Where that goes ethically is the book of Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Because there's no objective right and wrong anymore, so everybody just makes up their own right and wrong. One day it's one way, another day it's another way. Okay, so ethics leads to aesthetics. And so when the Greeks thought about it, they said there's three parts to aesthetics. The first is symmetry. There is a, a and there's proportion, and there is harmony. So you, you don't get too far in one way or the other way, and there's a symmetry to everything. It, it is orderly, it is not chaotic. They call this the golden mean, the arius mediocritus. That's the Latin phrase for it. And so they focused on three basic ingredients to beauty, symmetry, proportion, and harmony. And they applied this to every area. Life was to be lived according to that golden mean. Architecture was to reflect that. Education and politics. And what they, they didn't understand it quite this way, but as, as Christians we would understand it this way, that God built into the physical reality of his creation these truths. So that when, we, when you're building something in architecture and you, you, you have to construct it, you have to conform to the laws of geometry and trigonometry and gravity and all kinds of other laws. And, and then that which comes out conforms to all these things and, and, it, and it's beautiful. I'll, give you an, I'll show you some visual examples in just a minute. In the 6th century BC, Pythagoras discovered numerical relationships governing the basic intervals of music. See, music is related to math and ratios. It's not just, oh, how does it make me feel? That's just garbage. It's inherently mathematical. And so there's an objectivity to music. He said he discovered numerical relationships governing the basic intervals of music and attributed the craft and beauty of music to its underpinnings of universal principles. Almost all subsequent thought about aesthetics, beauty and music, until the Enlightenment was based on this thought. That governed, every, that governed the approach of art, architecture, everything up until the 1600s. In modern refinements on the Greek thought, beauty has three components. First, unity and integrity of the parts to the whole. Now that's important because in philosophy there's a tension between the one and the many. The, uh, we see this in politics between one government that's totalitarian and determines everything and the, the components, the people, are rather unimportant. The other extreme is the, emphasizes the many too much, and that leads to anarchy, where all the emphasis is on what everybody wants, pure democracy, and that leads to collapse also. That's no good. So you always have to find a balance, a, 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 a unity or an integrity between those two opposites. So you have unity or integrity of the parts to the whole. Second, proportion or harmony. It's got to be orderly and harm, uh, have a orderly and harmonious relation and arrangement of the parts so that everything fits together in a harmonious manner. And third, splendor. Splendor. Something can have the first two, but it just doesn't resonate. In splendor, it's glorious. And so this adds an element to it. Uh, it's glorious, it's magnificent, it's majestic, it's without monotony or chaos. Now I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. This is the Duomo, the central cathedral in Milan. And you look at the architecture there, how long it took. I mean, it still, technically it was declared to be finished, I think in the 1960s it was started. I forget how far back, 11th, 12th century. Still not technically f finished. But, but what, what do you want to do when you look at that picture? Your eyes go from the, looking at the front and they go up. 
It was all theologically driven. This, this architecture is designed to draw our attention upward to the God of creation. And everything is built according to symmetry, proportion, harmony, absolutely phenomenal. Now in this next picture, we're just getting a glimpse of it in this picture, but this is the Brunelleschi's dome that was built in Florence. Absolutely stunning, inside and out. I mean, the artwork on the inside of that dome has the most grotesque figures of Satan and the demons torturing those in hell that you'll ever see. Someday I'll use them in some illustrations. But uh, this building on the front left is the baptistry that was central in all worship because you had to be a member of the church, you had to be baptized to be able to worship, so it's always infant baptism. So that's usually built outside of the cathedral. This was the entry to the first cathedral, and again, you see the symmetry and the proportions and how everything fits together. And then you have uh, the dome, which is the largest uh, dome of its type in the world. It is not supported on the inside. They had a huge contest to figure out how to do this, and Brunelleschi, who was not really an architect at the time, comes up with this design, and it, it, it's just absolutely uh, magnificent. And so this is the uh, uh, photo of the cathedral there in Florence. Absolutely phenomenal. And you see the beauty of the architecture. And it has to conform to absolute principles. And because it conforms to those absolute principles, the result is you ju you're just stunned when you look at this. And you, you see how glorious it is. It, it's just magnificent. When we get to the scriptures, we have to talk about how do the scriptures talk about God and his creation. In Ecclesiastes 3.15, in the first line, states, he has made everything beautiful in its time. When God created, everything was beautiful. This is the Hebrew word yafet. We'll see several different Hebrew words related to it. There is not a specific Greek word for beauty that is used in the New Testament. But you see some beauty and some related concepts when we get into the Old Testament. So as a first point, the Bible uses a number of terms to express the beauty and the excellence of God. The excellence of God that, that God is A++ in every single attribute. He lacks nothing in anything. He is absolute. If he is perfect, perfect in everything, it flows that he must be the archetype of beauty. And Satan was created. And all of the descriptions of Satan are that he is beautiful. And guess what is one of the primary functions of Satan before he fell. It talks in Ezekiel, his timbrels and pipes. He is a musician. So there is music in heaven before there is ever, ever any sin. And that music is perfect music because there's no sin, there's no corruption, there's no flaws anywhere. So would that we could hear heavenly music and what that is like. Because we live in a world where everything that we see and everything we hear and everything we touch is corrupted by sin. And one of the problems in these debates over what makes good music, qualitative music for worship, is that there are those on who would disagree with me on many of my conclusions, but their problem is they think that music is neutral. And music isn't neutral. Remember, God is the archetype of beauty. He is beauty. And when Satan fell, Satan became the archetype of ugly. Now, he can cover it up. He can cloak it. But he is, he is the archetype of ugly. And, you know, someone once said that so somebody looked ugly that they looked like they had been beaten with the ugly for, ugly with an ugly stick and somebody said no they looked like they'd been beaten with the whole ugly forest that's 
Satan when he, but he can disguise himself like he did with, with Eve in the perfect perfection of the garden. Eve would never have been interested in talking to a creature that was ugly. So he cloaks himself. In 2 Corinthians 11, we're told that he and his angels go forth as ministers of righteousness, disguising themselves as angels of light. So he is the master counterfeiter, the master uh, deceiver. But God is the one who is the intrinsic standard of beauty. God possesses intrinsic beauty, which is the standard for all excellence, splendor, magnificence, beauty, and glory. We can't even come close to understanding all of that. But even in a fallen world, we have a sense. It doesn't matter where some people are from, what culture their background is, what their ethnicity is. They're all going to look at some things and go, boy, that's, that's just ugly. It's, it's not just ugly on the surface, it's ugly clear to the bone. And other people are going to look at some things, and, you know, everybody's going to look at certain things, they're going to say, that, 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 they're almost going to be speechless, it's so beautiful, it's just stunning. You see some things, you hear some music, you're just, you're just left standing in awe of what you just heard. It's masterful. And it fits certain, certain standards. So when I talk about intrinsic beauty... I mean, there's a beauty that is inherent in something that is independent of the response that is produced. It is not how it makes me feel that makes it beautiful. There is something intrinsic in it that makes it beautiful. And a a response that produced, a response produced relates to the subjective aspect. So when we say, well, that's just beautiful to me. Well, if we're going to have a transcendent God that we worship because he created all things, then beauty must be ultimately transcendent of all cultures. It must be transcendent of all philosophies. It must be transcendent of everything that is bound by a corrupt creature. So anything that is tainted by a fallen world isn't going to quite measure up, but we have that sense that there is something beautiful, just as we have a sense that there is something that should be just. When something happens that is a result of a corrupt world, we go, it's not fair, it's not just. But we have to deal with the fact that we live in a fallen world. Mortimer Adler, if you have ever seen the great books of the Western world, he was one of the editors of that series if not the chief editor, he said, we call the object beautiful because it has certain properties. See, he was, he was a philosopher as his profession. We call the object beautiful because it has certain properties that make it admirable. What we're asking is, what are those properties? But we have to start saying there are those objective properties because it's part of God's creation. There are certain properties that make it admirable. It has those properties. Whether or not it's having them results in being enjoyable by you and me. So we, we can go places where we are exposed to that which has objective beauty and, and is ob- objectively magnificent, but because of something lacking in our understanding, we don't appreciate it. But maybe we will later. It's like I mentioned earlier, when I read uh, Dwayne Lindsay in 1974, when I was uh, 21 years old, and I'm a senior in college, I thought it was great. When I went back, while I was in seminary, and I had a great, much greater appreciation for all of his work in the scriptures and uh, his explanations, I had a much higher capacity and a greater appreciation. When I went back... In the 80s and in the 90s and 10 or 12 years ago, each time I got more out of it because I knew more. And so a lot of times it's, it's not a, the, the failing is not in the art or the music. The failing is that, that the person who is listening to it or perceiving it doesn't have the right education to be able to properly understand and appreciate it. 
And that's a subjective aspect, but it doesn't affect the objective reality that there's truth. Now, when we get into the scripture, we have various words that are used that describe aesthetic excellence. Something is glorious, it's magnificent, it's majestic, it's splendid, it's beautiful, it's excellent. These are the words that we find uh, throughout the scripture. These words are used that we'll find as we go through some of the scripture. We won't get through very many tonight, but we'll hit the first two. The word tov. Now, this is an interesting word. You know, words do not have a field of meaning like this. It's not narrow. Okay, because you'll go to the dictionary and you'll read good or uh, sometimes it will be the word uh, pleasant. And so you always want to translate it with those two or three words that are listed in a lexicon. But, but words have a field of meaning like this. And English is, has a rich vocabulary. I've really run into that over the last 20 plus years working in other languages where you listen to a translator and realize that the Russian translator will translate six or eight words that I use in English all with the same Russian word. Because since the Protestant Reformation, remember the Protestant Reformation is 1517. The, if you look at the tra English translations of Win William Tyndale and tried to read them, you'll have, you'll have great difficulty what brought the English language together were two things that happened almost at the same, in the same decade. They did happen in the same decade. A little chap from Stratford-on-Avon called William Shakespeare and all of his plays, and then the King James, the authorized Bible. He had nothing to do with it except authorizing the translation. That solidified the English language because in household and upon household, family upon family, uh, ever since, people who speak English have been grounded in those two things if they were educated. And they read the family Bible. The Geneva Bible isn't altogether that much different. It was more different because it had theological notes with it. It came out in the 1550s about 50 years before the authorized translation. And really, when the Puritans came over here, they were toting the Geneva Bible, not the King James Bible, because they didn't remember, they didn't like the Stuart King at all. They disagreed with him. So it was a while before uh, the King Jimmy translation really caught on uh, towards the end of the 1600s and into the 1700s. But the word tov can mean something that's good, Sometimes people think that it has a moral connotation. <coughs> We've studied that in the first chapter of Genesis. God creates on the first day, at the end of the first day, says it's good. Oh, Satan couldn't have fallen then because everything's good. They read a moral tone into it. But the word tov is used in chapter 2 where God creates the man and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Wait a minute, if that word tov has a moral connotation, an inherent moral connotation, then you've got a problem, single men are immoral by definition. That's a real problem. So you can't look at the word tov and say it has a moral quality. And at the end when God looked at everything and said it was very good, it really has the sense of it is according to plan. God, who is a perfect architect, Okay, perfect designer. He creates everything from the macro systems of the universe and the uh, galaxies and the solar systems all the way down to subatomic universes. God designs everything from the, from the sub-minute all the way up to the grandiose. Everything perfectly, he takes everything into account and he had a master plan and a master blueprint and he says, he chopped his, deep, his work into seven, or actually six days. And he says, day one, he goes through his checklist. When he finishes, he says, okay, I did everything exactly as I intended. It's good. Day two, goes through his checklist, finishes, did everything. It's all according to plan. It's good. It's according to plan. Checks it off. When he finishes 
At the end of the sixth day, he says, it's very good. It's all completed. It's done. Everything according to plan. And it is beautiful, and it is, it is uh, uh, an ornament. It is adorned with God's, God's beauty. So that's the idea of tov. And you do pick up a secondary nuance of righteous or good in, the, in a moral sense later on, but not in those first two chapters of Genesis. It's like holy. Holy is, is that which is set apart to the use of God. But later, especially when you get to Isaiah 6, there's a contrast. Because God is holy, I'm of, un, of unclean lips. So there's that contrast. So that brings in a, a more of a moral sense to the concept of holiness. But it's not necessarily part of the, what linguists would say, the core semantic value. Yafa is the word to be fair, or to be beautiful, to be handsome, Genesis 12.11, 12.14. Atsavi is the word meaning uh, beauty, splendor, something magnificent, Ezekiel 20, verse 6. And Hadar, honor, adornment, or glorify. So those are four, there's three or four others, but those are the main words. And I want to hit this one verse before we get we go tonight. Second Chronicles twenty twenty one. Now this is an interesting little passage in Second Chronicles twenty uh, twenty twenty one. It's a situation where, that talks about um, a problem that Israel is facing. The problem is the enemies on the what we would call the East Bank today, the Jordan side of the river. And um, Jehoshaphat is the king, and he's faced with a, with a, uh, a, a confederation of or an alliance of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites, and they want to attack him. And so he's got to deal with this particular situation and that's really what is, what is described uh, in the first part of this chapter. What we're going to get to down in verse 21 is what I'm going to call the ambush by choir. That's, that's what happens. So they, they get together, and then um, Jehoshaphat in verse 2 is, uh, is warned about this. He's told about this and what the situation is. And so he calls the people together for a fast and to seek God. And he goes to the temple to address the Lord in prayer and to call for, upon God to protect them and watch over them. And that's included in verses 6 to 12 where he gives his petition uh, before the Lord to watch over them and protect them and give them victory over the Moabites. Now this is the pattern. He doesn't say, we need God, we need more spears, increase the budget, we need to build a few more ammunition plants, we need to train for a while. He says, God, you're it. You're the one who controls everything. And in verse 12, he says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's a great prayer in this election year. Mark it down. There's a great multitude out there that wants to take our freedoms, our liberties away from us and turn this into the most corrupt country in the world. And only God can deliver us. That is a great prayer, verse 12. So verse 13, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. So he's got this huge crowd around the temple and one in the midst of them is... Um, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, he is a prophet, and he speaks, and he says, Listen, all of you in Judah and all you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Good, good memory verse again. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, it is God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Now, See, when we're operating on the face rest, rest drill, what God wants us to do doesn't fit Sun Tzu. It doesn't fit the strategy books, necessarily. It's based on trusting him and what he tells us to do. Now, he didn't tell us what to do like this, like he did back then. And he says, go down against them, 
They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jaruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Wait a minute. How are we going to win if we don't fight? Just position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for Yahweh is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. See, that's prayer, dependence upon God, claiming promises. That's worship. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Yahweh Elohim of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. Believe in Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh Eloheinu. And you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Wait a minute, you're going to battle. He appoints a choir. Why does he appoint the choir? He appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. That's our verse. They are praising the beauty of holiness. Now to say that, that means God's holiness has beauty, like a good play on a football field or a good triple play in baseball. There's just a beauty to it. But God, the beauty of God's holiness just goes far beyond anything that we can we can ever imagine. And he says uh, th that you should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, they were singing, Hallelujah, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. God set the ambush and caused them to fight one another, and they defeated each other, and the Israelites did not have to fight because the battle was the Lord's. So... This is what we need to learn here. It's worship of the beauty of holiness. So God is intrinsically beautiful. Now next time we're going to come back and look at some other uses of this phrase and develop our understanding of a biblical view of aesthetics and beauty and how that applies to music and singing. And it should also apply to our spiritual life. We're to be creating something beautiful for God that actually the Holy Spirit is creating in our lives. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word this evening and to flesh out these ideas and to come to understand that, that beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the objective conformity to certain ideals that you establish within your creation, certain absolutes. Father, help us to see that that must apply to everything in our spiritual life, everything in our lives, and especially what we sing, the music we play, all of this conforms to something that is of an eternal, absolute, intrinsic beauty. Challenge us to think through these things and reflect on them. In Christ's name, amen.